नमस्कार दिस इज द रिसेटेशन ऑफ एक्सट्रैक्ट हु एम आई नन्नी आर द टीचिंग्स ऑफ भगवान श्री रमना महर्षि ट्रांसलेशन बाय डॉक्टर टी एम पी महादेवन फ्रॉम द ओरिजिनल तमिल इंट्रोडक्शन हु एम आई इज द टाइटल गिवन टू द सेट ऑफ क्वेश्चन एंड एंसर्स बियरिंग ऑन सेल्फ इंक्वायरी The questions were put to Bhagwan Sri Ramana Maharshi by one Sri M Siva Prakasham Pillai about year 1902. Sri Pillai, a graduate in philosophy, was at the time employed in the revenue department of the South Arcot Collectorate. During his visit to Tirumalai in 1902 and on official work, he went to Virupaksha Cave on Arunachal Hill and met the master there. he sought from him spiritual guidance and solicited answers to questions relating to self inquiry as bhagwan was not talking then not because of any woe he had taken but because he did not have the inclination to talk he answered the questions put to him by gestures and when these were not understood by writing as recollected and recorded by shri sivaprakasham pillai there were 14 questions with answers to them given by bhagwan This record was first published by Sri Pillai in 1923 along with a couple of poems composed by himself relating how Bhagwan's grace operated in his case by dispelling his doubts and by saving him from crisis in life. Who am I has been published several times subsequently we find 30 questions and answers in some editions and 28 in others. There is also another published version in which the questions are not given and the teachings are rearranged in the form of an essay. The extant lang English translation uh, is of this essay. The present rendering is of the text in the form of 28 questions and answers. Along with vichar sangraham self inquiry nanyar who am i constitutes the first set of instructions in the master's own words. these two are the only prosipices among bhagwan's work they clearly set forth the central teachings that the direct path to liberation is self inquiry the particular mode in which the inquiry is to be made is lucidly set forth in nanyar the mind consists of thoughts the i thought is the first to arise in the mind when the inquiry who am i is persistently pursued all other thoughts get destroyed and finally the i thought itself vanishes leaving the supreme non dual self alone the false identification of the self with the phenomena of non self such as body and mind thus ends and there is illumination shakshatakar the process of inquiry of course is not an easy one as one inquires who am i other thoughts will arise but as they arise one should not yield to them by following them on the contrary one should ask to whom do they arise in order to do this one has to be extremely vigilant through constant inquiry one should make the mind stay in its source without allowing it to wander away and get lost in the mazes of thoughts created by itself all other disciplines such as breath control and meditation on the forms of god should be regarded as auxiliary practices they are useful in so far as they help the mind to become quiescent and one pointed for the mind that has gained skill in concentration self inquiry becomes comparatively easy it is by ceaselessly inquiry that the thoughts are destroyed and the self realized the plenary reality in which there is not even the i thought the experience which is referred to as silence this in substance is bhagwan shri ram Ramana Maharshi is teaching in Nanyar who am i Om namo bhagavate shri ramayana who am i nanyar as all living beings desire to be happy always without misery as in the case of everyone there is absolute supreme love for oneself and as happiness alone is the cause for love in order to gain that happiness which is one's nature and which is experienced in the state of deep sleep where there is no mind one should know one's self for that the path of knowledge the inquiry of the form who am i is the principal means one who am i the gross body which is composed of seven humors dhatus 
I am not. The five cognitive senses, organs, visually, the senses of hearing, touch, sight, taste and smell, which apprehend their respective objects visually, sound, touch, color, taste and odor, I am not. The five cognitive sense organs, visually the organs of speech, locomotion, grasping, excretion, procreation, which have as their respective functions, speaking, moving, grasping, excreting and enjoying, I am not. The five vital airs, prana, etc., which performs respectively the five functions of inbreathing, etc., I am not. Even the mind, which thinks, I am not. The nations too, which is endowed only with the residual impression of objects and in which there are no objects and no functionings, I am not. If I am none of these, then who am I, is the second question. After negating all of the ever mentioned as not this, not this, that awareness, which alone remains, that I am. 3. What is the nature of awareness? The nature of awareness is existence, consciousness, bliss. Number 4. When will the realization of the self be gained? When the world which is what is seen has been removed, there will be realization of the self which is the seer. Number 5. Will there not be realization of the self even while the world is there? In brackets, taken as real? There will not be. 6. Why? The seer and the object seen are like the rope and the snake. Just as the knowledge of the rope which is the substrate will not arise unless the false knowledge of the illusory serpent goes, so the realization of the self which is the substrate will not be gained unless the belief that the world is real is removed. Number 7. When will the world which is the object seen be removed? When the mind which is the cause of all cognitions and of all actions becomes quiescent, the world will disappear. Number 8. What is the nature of the mind? What is called mind is a wondrous power residing in the self. It causes all thoughts to arise. Apart from thoughts, there is no such thing as mind. Therefore, thought is the nature of mind. Apart from thoughts, there is no independent entity called the world. In deep sleep, there are no thoughts and there is no world. In the states of waking, walking and dream, there are thoughts and there is a world also. Just as the spider emits the thread of the web out of itself and again withdraws it into itself, likewise, the mind projects the world out of itself and again resolves it into self. itself. When the mind comes out of the self, the world appears. Therefore, when the world appears to be real, the self does not appear. And when the self appears, shines, the world does not appear. When one persistently inquires into the nature of the mind, the mind will end leaving the self as the residue. What is referred to as self is the Atman. The mind always exists only in dependence on something gross. It cannot stay alone. It is the mind that is called the subtle body or soul, Jiva. Number 9. What is the path of inquiry for understanding the nature of the mind? That which arises, that which rises as I in this body is the mind. If one inquires as to where in the body the thought I rises first, one would discover that it rises in the heart. That is the place of the mind's origin. Even if one thinks constantly I, I, one will be led to that place. Of all the thoughts that arise in the mind, the I thought is the first. It is only after the rise of this that the other thoughts arise. It is after the appearance of the first personal pronoun that the second and third personal pronouns appear. Without the first personal pronoun, there will not be the second and third. Number 10. How will the mind become quiescent? By the inquiry, who am I? The thought, who am I, will destroy all other thoughts and like the stick used for stirring the burning pyre, it will itself in the end get destroyed. Then there will arise self-realization. Number 11. What is the means for constantly holding on to the thought, who am I? When other thoughts arise, one should not pursue them but should inquire to whom do they arise? 
it does not matter how many thoughts arise. As each thought arises, one should inquire with diligence. To whom has this thought arisen? The answer that would emerge would be to me. Thereupon, if one inquires, who am I? The mind will go back to the source and the thought that arose will become quiescent. With the repeated practice in this manner, the mind will develop the skill to stay in its source. When the mind that is subtle goes out through the brain and the sense organs, the gross names and forms appear. When it stays in the heart, the names and forms disappear. Not letting the mind go out, but retaining it in the heart is what is called inwardness. Antarmukha. Letting the mind go out of the heart is known as externalization. Bahirmukha. Thus, when the mind stays in the heart, the I, which is the source of all thoughts, will go and the self, which ever exists, will shine. Whatever one does, one should do without the egoity I. If one acts in that way, all will appear as the nature of Shiva, God. Number 12. Are there no other means for making the mind quiescent? Other than inquiry, there are no adequate means. If through other means, it is sought to control the mind. The mind will appear to be controlled, but will again go forth. Through the control of breath, also the mind will become quiescent, but it will be quiescent only so long as the breath remains controlled. And when the breath resumes, the mind also will again start moving and will wander as impelled by residual impressions. The source is the same for both mind and breath. Thought, indeed, is the nature of the mind. The thought, I, is the first thought of the mind, and that is egoity. It is from that whence egoity originates that breath also originates. Therefore, when the mind becomes quiescent, the breath is controlled, and when the breath is controlled, the mind becomes quiescent. But in deep sleep, although the mind becomes quiescent, the breath does not stop. This is because of the will of God. So, that the body may be preserved and the other people may not be under the impression that it is dead. In the state of waking and in samadhi, when the mind becomes quiescent, the breath is controlled. Breath is gross form of mind. Till the time of death, the mind keeps breath in the body. And when the body dies, the mind takes the breath along with it. Therefore, the exercise of breath control is only an aid for rendering the mind quiescent. Mano nigraha. It will not destroy the mind. Mano nasa. Like the practice of breath control, meditation on the forms of God, repetition of mantras, restriction on food, etc. are but aids for rendering the mind quiescent. Through meditation, one on the forms of God and through repetition of mantras, the mind becomes one-pointed. The mind will always be wandering. Just as when a chain is given to an elephant to hold in its trunk, it will go along grasping the chain and nothing else. So also, when the mind is occupied with the name or form, it will grasp that alone. When the mind expands in the form of countless thoughts, each thought becomes weak. But as thoughts get resolved, the mind becomes one-pointed and strong. For such a mind, self-inquiry will become easy. Of all the restrictive rules that relating to the taking of sattvic food in modern quantities is the best. By observing this rule, the sattvic quality of mind will increase and that will be helpful to self-inquiry. Number 13. The residual impressions, thoughts of objects appear wending like the waves of an ocean. When will all of them get destroyed? As the meditations on the self rises higher and higher, thoughts will get destroyed. Number 14. Is it possible for the residual impressions of objects that come from be beginningless time as it were to be resolved and for one to remain as the pure self? Without yielding to the doubt, is it possible or not, one should persistently hold on to the meditation on the self. Even if one be a great sinner, one should not worry and weep, Oh, I am sinner. How can I be saved? One should completely renounce the thought, I am a sinner, and concentrate keenly on the meditation on the self. Then one would surely succeed. There are not two minds, one good and the other evil. The mind is only one. It is the residual impression that are of two kinds, auspicious and inauspicious. When the mind is under the influence of auspicious impressions, it is called good. And when it is under the influence of inauspicious impressions, it is regarded as evil. 
the mind should not be allowed to wander towards worldly objects and what concerns other people. However, bad other people may be, one should bear no hatred for them. Both desire and hatred should be eschewed. All that one gives to others, one gives to one's self. If this truth, truth is understood, who will not give to others? When one's self arises, all arises. When one's self becomes squeezed, all becomes squeezed. To the extent we behave with humility, to the extent there will result good. If the mind is rendered quiescent, one may live anywhere. Number 15. How long should inquiry be practiced? As long as there are impressions of objects in the mind, so long the inquiry, who am I, is required. As thoughts arise, they should be destroyed then and there in the very place of their origin through inquiry. If one resorts to contemplation of the self unintermittently until the self is gained, that alone would do. As long as there are enemies within the fortress, they will continue to sally forth. If they are destroyed as they emerge, the fortress will fall into our hands. Number 16. What is the nature of the self? What exists in truth is the self alone. The world, the individual soul and God are appearances in it. Like silver in mother of pearl, these three appear at the same time and disappear at the same time. The self is that where there is absolutely no I thought. That is called silence. The self itself is the world. The self itself is I. The self itself is God. All is Shiva, the self. Number 17. Is not everything the work of God? Without desire, resolve or effort, the sun rises. And in its mere presence, the sun's stones emit fire. The lotus blooms. Water evaporates. People perform their various functions and then rest. Just as in the presence of the magnet, the needle moves, it is by virtue of the mere presence of God that the souls governed by the three cosmic functions or the fivefold divine activity perform their actions and then rest in accordance with their respective karmas. God has no resolve. No karma attaches itself to him. That is like worldly actions not affecting the sun or like the merits and demerits of the other four elements not affecting all pervading space. Number 18. Of the devotees, who is the greatest? He who gives himself up to the self, that is God, is the most excellent devotee. Giving oneself up to God means remaining constantly in the self without giving room for the rise of any thoughts other than that of self. Whatever burdens are thrown on God, he bears them. Since the supreme power of God makes all things move, why should we, without submitting ourselves to it, constantly worry ourselves with a thought as to what should be done and how, and what should not be done and how not? We know that the train carries all loads so that getting on it, why should we carry our small luggage on our head to our discomfort instead of putting it down in the train and feeling at ease? Number 19. What is non-attachment? As thoughts arise, destroying them utterly without any residue in the very place of their origin is non-attachment. Just as the pearl diver ties a stone to his waist, sinks to the bottom of the sea and there takes the pearls. So each one of us should be endowed with non-attachment. Dive within oneself and obtain the self-pearl. Number 20. Is it possible for God and the Guru to effect the release of a soul? God and the Guru will only show the way to release. They will not by themselves take the soul to the state of release. In truth, God and the Guru are not different. Just as the prey which has fallen into the jaws of a tiger has no escape, so those who have come within the ambit of the Guru's gracious look will be saved by the Guru and will not get lost. Yet, each one should by his own effort pursue the path shown by God or Guru and gain release. One can know oneself only with one's own eye of knowledge and not with somebody else. Does he who is a Rama require the help of a mirror to know that he is a Rama? Number 21. Is it necessary for one who longs for release to inquire into the nature of categories, tattvas? Just as one who wants to throw away garbage has no need to analyze it and see what it is, so one who wants to know the self has no need to count the number of categories or inquire into their characteristics. What he has to do is to reject altogether the categories that hide the self. The world should be considered like a dream. Number 22. 
Is there no difference between walking, waking and dream? Waking is long and dream short. Other than they, this, there is no difference. Just as waking happenings seem real while awake, so do those in dream while dreaming. In dream, the mind takes on another body. In both waking and dream states thought. In both waking and dream states thoughts. Names and forms occur simultaneously. Number 23. Is it any use reading books for those who long for release? All the texts say that in order to gain release, one should render the mind quiescent. Therefore, their conclusive teaching is that the mind should be rendered quiescent. Once this has been understood, there is no need for endless reading. In order to quieten the mind, one has only to inquire within oneself what oneself is. How could this search be done in books? One should know one's self with one's own eye of wisdom. The self is within the five sheets, but books are outside them. Since the self has to be inquired into the discarding the five sheets, it is futile to search for it in books. There will come a time when one will have to forget all that one has learned. Number 24. What is happiness? Happiness is the very nature of the self. Happiness and self are not different. There is no happiness in any object of the world. We imagine through our ignorance that we derive happiness from objects. When the mind goes out, it experiences misery. In truth, when its desires are fulfilled, it returns to its own place and enjoys the happiness that is the self. Similarly, in the states of sleep, samadhi and fainting, and when the object desire, desired is obtained or the object disliked is removed, the mind becomes inward turned and enjoys pure self-happiness. Thus the mind moves without thus the mind moves without rest, alternatively going out in the self and returning to it. Under the tree, the shade is pleasant. Out in the open, the heat is scorching. A person who has been going about in the sun feels cool when he reaches the shade. Someone who keeps on going from shade into the sun and then back into the shade is a fool. A wise man stays permanently in the shade. Similarly, the mind of one who knows the truth does not leave Brahman. The mind of the ignorant, on the contrary, resolves in the world. It revolves in the world, feeling miserable, and for the little time returns to Brahman to experience happiness. In fact, what is called the world is only thought. When the world disappears, that is when there is no thought, the mind experiences happiness, and when the world appears, it goes through misery. Number 25. What is wisdom, insight, jnana drashti? Remaining quiet is what is called wisdom, insight. To remain quiet is to dissolve the mind in the self. Telepathy, knowing past, present and future happenings and clairvoyance do not constitute wisdom, insight. Number 26. What is the relation between desirelessness and wisdom? Desirelessness is wisdom. The two are not different, they are the same. Desirelessness is refraining from turning the mind towards any object. Wisdom means the appearance of no object. In other words, not seeking what is other than the self is detachment or desirelessness. Not leaving the self is wisdom. Number 27. What is the difference between inquiry and meditation? Inquiry consists in retaining the mind in the self. Meditation consists in thinking that one's self is Brahman. Existence Consciousness, bliss. Number 28. What is release? Inquiring into the nature of one's self that is in the bondage and realizing one's true nature is release. Sri Dhamana Paranam Thank you.